Man, huh? Who loves, who just loves Christmas? You just love Christmas. Who is in the middle of the road when it comes to Christmas? You can be honest, we won't hate you. And who's just like, nah, it's not for me. I'm like right there. Like I am, I'm not a Grinch. I promise you I won't steal your Christmas. And I'm not a bah humbug. But man, right on the day of Christmas is when I really like it. Like the day of. Waking up in hopes of finding a present under the tree. I had, thanks Mark. I had, I had someone tell me one time that, that Santa is just Satan with a few letters <laughs> rearranged. I was, I, so anyway, I just, I, I, I like Christmas Day. But leading up to it, full disclosure, it's, it's one of these things where it's like, I got to really work myself up. My, I just decorated my tree yesterday. Okay, who, who is one of these people you just, you get your tree out and you decorate it like right after or even before Thanksgiving? Come on, be honest. Yeah? Oh, my goodness. I just, I looked at that tree and I went, I don't know if I want to do this or not. And Kristen's like, we have to, we have to decorate it. We have to decorate it. We got it. No, it is real. And, and we have to do it like this. And I said, oh, oh don't make me. And uh, so, so I did what any good husband would do. I took a nap. I said, baby, just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. An hour and a half later, like, I hit that REM sleep where I dreamt I was decorating the tree, hoping that when I got up, it'd be done, you know? I was like, yes, oh, that looks really good right there. And then I got up and it wasn't done, and I was so sad. But uh, I decorated it, everything was fine, and it was good. And, uh, but right around these times is where we start just, just kind of honing in on on Christmas and what Jesus really did and what really mattered most. You know, without the birth, there'd be no death of Jesus. It's easy to focus in on the death and the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, but we always have to remember that there was a price to pay at the beginning as well. When Jesus was born, there was a price that he paid there as much as he did while on the cross. And, and, and there's just something about that that I think that a lot of believers and Christians, I know for me, you know, is not focusing so much on Christmas all the time. I like presents, okay? So if you want to give me one, you can. But just teasing. It, it's one of these things where I just go, I just go, man, we need to focus in on this. Sometimes we just kind of forget. We kind of, we kind of don't remember um, all the important things that are wrapped up in this time and in this season. Um, before, I, before I move on, I do want to just share a quick testimony. If you're not a deer hunter, um, I want to encourage you to close your ears. Okay, nobody's closing your ears? Good. I had so much fun. I, I was so thankful that I got my first deer ever in my life last week. I put in so much work since bow hunting season opened. And, and, and shot at a few, missed many. Oh, man, I missed one at 12 yards away. How do you do that? I don't know, but I did. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, the nerves got the best of me. But uh, did, did all that. I was very thankful for that. And our very own Quentin Pataska helped me come on out there and, and manage that thing. Do all the things. I won't get too graphic, but do all the things you're supposed to do to deer so you can, you know. So we can do what it was meant to do, which was feed us. And so did that, took it on. It's so much fun, and I was very, very happy about that. So praise the Lord. Um, um, they say that the real work happens after um, you shoot the deer, and they weren't kidding. That is, uh, that is, I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't have a couple of friends helping me out. It just was crazy. I don't know, that had nothing to do with Christmas, just, you know, Merry Christmas to me. Now I get to go pay money to have a process. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Right? So, I want you to turn your Bibles real quick to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're going to get into the story of the three, the three wise men or three magi who came to the manger of Jesus when he was born to seek out the king. And I want to encourage you guys with a word here before we get really moving in this. 
I want you to know something that 2020 isn't done yet. Amen? Amen. Come on, somebody. 2020 is not finished yet. And I'm not about to go into 2021 with the luggage that tried to be on my back in 2020. It ain't going to happen. We are going to move forward. We're going to advance the kingdom. I don't care what the world is telling me. I don't care what's happening in our culture right now. I don't care what's happening with our election. I don't care what's taking place. All I know is that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that's where I'm going to stand. We are not going to move into 2021 with the same kind of vibe as 2020 because there is something new that God is doing in your life right now. It's really, under, it's really important to understand this, that God has his own timeline. He doesn't operate under our calendar, all right? But we operate under our calendar. In 2021, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but 2021 is the new year for newness in your life. I, I, there will be, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if some new things pop up within the next few months in your life. Some new things pop up. It is God's timing right now for the old to be gone and the new begin to happen. Now, with that new, you know, the, the definition of, of insanity is continuing to do the same things and expect a different result. You're going to have to live differently. <laughs> You're going to have to do some new things if you want to get some newness in your life. You're going to have to live a life that is full of surrender and humility. We're going to have to live our lives according to the word of God where we don't have the form of godliness and deny its power. We need to have the cross at hand with the kingdom of God in our, in our vision and move forward. Because we, I am, listen, as long as I'm alive here on this earth, 2021 is not going to look the same as 2020. We are going to see some great and mighty things take place. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. We're not going to have the luxury of carrying our sickness with us into 2021. Why? Because God's doing a new thing. According to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, behold, I am doing a new thing. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But everyone in our world right now is going, I can't wait for 2020 to be done. <laughs> not me, baby. 2020, man, we're supposed to be flying in cars by now. There's a lot of, which I think that kind of happened a little bit, but they crashed. <laughs> there is something brewing in the spirit realm right now. And I hope that you guys, and I hope that we can, and I can, feel that out, sense it, move with the direction of the spirit. You know, the Bible says that if you claim to live by the spirit, that we must keep step with the spirit. If you're not keeping step with the spirit, maybe we need to come back to the cross and ask the Lord, what do I need to give up so I can feel your spirit again? Amen? Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're going to read the story of these wise men, and we're going to break it down a little bit. Verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, somebody asked me this morning um, before church, are you ever going to preach again at church? I said, maybe. We'll see. Those of you who don't know, I was in sunny Florida, 89 degree weather, sipping on sweet tea. So good, man. I'm trying to make you guys jealous, so we have something to repent for, right? Just, I'm teasing. All right, moving on. Here we go. Matthew chapter 2. Verses 1 through 12, this is what it says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, the Magi, traditionally known as wise men, came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who, was, who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. 
When King Herod heard that, when King, King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. They replied, for this was the prophet that is written. But you, Bethlehem, verse 6, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Um, I asked this first service, um, um, but I, I, I saw online that there is, the planets are going to align and there's going to be a big star. Is that, that's true, right? How cool is that going to be, huh? Wouldn't that be something that Jesus just came back like that? <laughs> you know, they say all the stars got aligned. What if they did and Jesus came back? Whew. You know what they say, get right or get left. Anyway, first 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. These are the Magi. Then they opened up their treasures and presented presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Thank God that, G, that, that the Holy Spirit came to those three wise men and gave them a dream not to go back and report, not to go back and do what the king told them to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank God for that. You know, I'm amazed at these three magi, these three wise men, But before we talk about them, we're going to talk a little bit about what King Herod's role was in this whole mix. The whys to why he wanted to come back and report and all these kinds of things. Now, you do know that King Herod at that time didn't want any other king rising up above him. So when he heard of the birth of Jesus, another royalty, he said in his words, listen to me, he said in his words, bring that Jesus to me so I can worship him. But really on the intention of his heart, what he wanted to do was to kill, steal, and destroy the liberty that Jesus was going to bring on that day because another king was being risen up in that moment. And isn't it like King Herod amongst our churches today where a lot of us worship with our lips, but our hearts are far from it? We say We go and we do this and we worship Jesus, but yet the intention of our heart never ceases to fall back into the places of death and sin and all this mess when God is just saying to us, just come clean. Just come to me and be transparent. See, King Herod had a plan and the plan was to trick the Magi to showing where Jesus was so he can kill the freedom before it became a reality. See, King Herod, in today's world, equals the religious thinking. Religious stinking thinking is what I call it. An outward appearance of worship, but an inward plan to kill the freedom that Jesus brings by trying to manipulate, control, All these things, I want you to know something, that as we enter into this new time, I'm not even going to call it a season. I'm not going to call it a new thing. I'm calling it a new era. Something is happening. God is switching the course and the direction of our life, of our futures. Hear me out for a second. He's switching the course of direction for our future. What was before might have worked then. It's not going to work in the new thing that God has for us. 
It's not going to work. So that means you and I have to come to Jesus and ask him to change us, to transform us so we can align ourselves with the new thing. You see, before Jesus, it was all this religious stuff. Jesus came in and brought a period of time where it was brand new. Brand new. They never heard of it before. It's the reason why everything that was religious up until the birth of Jesus and then when Jesus was born, they tried to come and destroy that because they were afraid of the new thing that was going to happen. You see, and God wants us not to just give him lip service, but to come to him with the intentions of our heart and spill ourselves before him and surrender that before him. See, religious thinking puts the outward appearance so the world will see. But Jesus works on the inside so the outside can also be clean. It's not enough anymore, guys. Hear me. If there's anything, I think one of the theme verses for my life in 2021, heading into 2021, is this. That I will never have the form of godliness and deny its power. Because for a long time, the church has had the form of godliness by doing all the good things, but we've denied the power of the cross to transform and change lives. Not everywhere, not everyone, obviously, but let's just ask ourselves, has that been you? Have we had the form of godliness? Yes, I read my Bible. Yes, I kind of read my Bible. Yes, I kind of pray. Yes, I kind of do these things. But yet your heart is full of stuff that does not honor God. We need to come back to the place where we give our hearts the f- everything that we are. We sang it today in worship. Everything that we are that makes up me and you, that makes up us. You know, you can say anything you want to all day long, but God knows your heart. God knows your mind. And when we get to heaven, he's not going to ask you what you did for him. He's going to ask you, do I know you or not? This may not be very Christmassy, but Merry Christmas, everyone. I told you how I felt about it. But when we get to heaven, Jesus' concern is going to be, depart from me, worker of iniquity, I never knew you, or good, good, well done, good and faithful servant, come on into my eternity. There's no in between. And the only way that you can spend eternity with him is if you give yourself to him completely. Everything, the intentions of your heart. Maybe you have some secret things going on like old King Herod did. He had a lip service, I want to worship him. But his heart was full with the wrong intention. His intention was to put to death this new thing called freedom and royalty. And you got to be real honest with yourself, people. Listen, there's no more time for playing games anymore. If you want to play games with Jesus, your time will be cut short, I promise you, right? And I'm I'm not saying like you're going to die or nothing like that, but what I'm saying is this, that that this, we have a window right now to come to Jesus and be open before him and say, I don't have it figured out. I don't have all the things. I mess up. God, I just want to give myself to you. Put your pride away. Put it all away. Put, Put everything away and just say, God, here I am, stripped down before you. I just want to give you my heart, everything that I am. We have a window here of grace and opportunity because the time will come where the sheep and the goats will be separated. You have to ask yourself, which one will you be? Which one will I be? I pray and I ask Jesus, God, help me to be on that right side. Help me, Father, to be close to you. See, these three wise men, They're well-respected in the community. They're well-respected by leaders in the community. They're well-educated. They're well-established. They weren't these crazy people out there, right? These were the ones that were out there going, yeah, we know what we're talking about. And it's interesting. It's so awesome that only one encounter with Jesus can change a life and change a heart. These three wise men were also very willing to follow God's leading to the Savior of the world. 
to follow that star, no matter where it took him, no matter where it took him, God says, I want to follow. They said, I want to follow wherever it goes to meet the Savior of the world. You see, when the Magi came, when these three wise men came, they brought gifts. They brought gold, right? They brought frankincense, and they brought myrrh. Okay? These three things were very important prophetically in the story in the birth of Jesus. We look at these and go, well, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that's super cool, all right? But these things had a prophetic significance in the launching of the Savior of the world. It didn't happen just on the cross. It happened in this birth, right? And here's what they are. Gold, when they brought gold, one wise man brought gold and said, here, I want to acknowledge this little eight-pound, two-ounce baby Jesus. We're acknowledging him today as royalty. See, in the Old Testament times, it was acceptable and expected to bring gold when visiting royalty. When people came to visit kings, gold would be used to signify someone's wealth and appreciated value as king. You see, what's really awesome about this, when we talk about gold, and we talk about gold being, wouldn't you want that? That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? I don't know if they brought gold bricks or not, but make it rain. So they brought these, they brought this gold. And what's really interesting about this is that the same gold that they brought to Jesus was the same exact gold that was made for the ring when the father gave it to the prodigal son. You guys remember this story where, they, where, they, where, they, uh, where the father was waiting for the prodigal son who was wasting all of his riches, right? And the brother was getting jealous about everything over here. Here I am working and doing all the things, but you're going to throw him the biggest party when he comes back? Yeah, of course I am, right? The father gave him the best sandals, the best robe, and gave him a ring signifying his royalty. You see, <clears throat> that gold, that gold signified you are royalty. And not only did they prophetically do that for Jesus, but Jesus took upon himself that royalty, took it to the cross as the king of kings. And then now when he died on the cross, he rose again on the third day and then now made you the same kind of royalty. He put the ring on your finger when you say, I do to Jesus. The same gold ring is now not just on your hand, but it's in your heart. It's written on your heart. You see, gold, according to heaven, really is of the lowliest value because even the streets are made with gold. God's like, nah, gold, whatever. That's like asphalt to me. We're just going to pave the streets with gold in heaven. See, for us, it's extremely valuable. If you're a prepper right now, right, they're telling you, stock up on gold and silver. Ooh, it's going to get bad, right? I'm stocking up on brass, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's just pretty easy. Right, Quentin? Hi, this is welcome all of our online viewers today. Thanks, online stream, for joining us. But here we are. The gold represents royalty. And Jesus said in his word that my blood is more precious than silver or gold. His sacrifice for you on the birth, the death, the burial, and the resurrection was more precious than anything physical that can be given to anybody. Let me just tell you something. When you come to know who Jesus is, he values you more than anybody else, than anything else in this whole world because he paid the ultimate price for your life. Amen? On that day, prophetically, Jesus became royalty. He was recognized as royalty, and he began the clock for you and I 
to align ourselves with that same royalty. I love my dog, Baxter. He's awesome. But Baxter will walk around my table and just wait for anything to drop from it. You guys know, right? If you have a dog, you know what I'm talking about. Unless you're like super trained the dog. Our dog's not really trained. It just, I mean, Baxter just waits for anything. We're cleaning the counters in the kitchen. Something drops, something goes there and eats it. Whatever it is. It's like the dog's always starving for some reason. I'm like, golly, don't you eat ever? There's a story in the Bible where a woman says, I'll even eat the crumbs of the master's table. And Jesus says, no, come up here to the table with me because you're better than that. And I think a lot of the times us as believers don't align ourselves with the royalty we really are. We align ourselves with the puppies we think we are. And God wants us to move us from the floor to the table. Hear what I'm saying? Because you have to align yourself with who God calls you, especially in these last days, because if you haven't been tested yet, you will be. You will be. And we have to learn that I am the head and not the tail. I am the front and not the end. I am with Christ seated with him in heavenly places as I speak. Because that's what he died for. Amen? So they brought gold, signifying of his royalty. Then they brought frankincense. Frankincense is a common type of essential oil used in aromatherapy that can offer a variety of health benefits, including helping relieve chronic stress and anxiety. My wife went through an essential oil phase. It wasn't really, well, it was kind of like essential oil, but it was something different, but, you know, oil. And, um, and so I got her for Christmas one year, or she brought it. Or, you know, when you're married a long time, you just, your wife just buys gifts for herself and says, thank you for the Christmas gift later to you. Like, all right, cool. You're welcome. I love you. And, uh, and so something like that transacted. And, and, uh, um, and so I've got these, these essential oil bottles, you know, in a little package. But now they're all like all over the place. We've got Breathe and we've got this and we've got that. And they're all made up of all kinds of things. And I, I put it in the little diffuser it comes with. You guys know what I'm talking about? Right? You put it in a little diffuser in the full disclosure. Sometimes I just sit there like this when no one's looking. I go... And an hour passes by, I'm like, oh, Father. <sighs> so good. Just breathe that in. I'm sure it's messing up my lungs with all that synthetic juice going on. But it's okay. I'm in it for the long haul, right? And see, when they brought this frankincense, this essential oil, if you will, it was ground from this kind of stuff right here. It was ground from... I don't know exactly what it was ground from, but they ground it up and they made this oil, right? And they brought that. And what they were doing was, prophetically speaking, they were signifying that not only are you royalty because of the gold, but they're signifying now you are the healer because here's the oil of healing. So that day, Jesus, when he was born, these wise men came and says, you are royalty, but you're also the healer. You're also the healer. They agreed with what heaven was saying right, about baby Jesus. Jesus, in that form as a baby, had more power than all the powers of the world put together, right? Had more power. Why? Because he was born a king, and he died as the king, and he died and resurrected as the king, right? And so here's Jesus in this little manger, and they signify, they prophesied over him, you are royalty, and you are the hero. Let me tell you something here today that I refuse, no matter what happens in my body, no matter what my body is trying to tell me, no matter what's going on, I refuse to carry into 2021 the sicknesses that came with me in 2020. Why? Because I know and I believe and I trust and I have faith in God that he is my healer. And he is your healer. 
Listen, we can't just settle anymore. Come on, somebody. We can't just settle anymore and say, this is how it's going to be. This is how I'm going to be. This is how it was for me in 2020 and the years coming up to it. Listen, whatever happened from now, from then up until 2020, God's going to do something new in your life. God's going to do something new in your life. You are going to be completely healed. Amen? Amen. Healing. Well, I'll just always be, I'll, I'll, I'll always have anxiety. I understand chemical imbalances, and I'm not trying to push these things down and say they're not important. I understand these things. But let me just tell you, that's not who you are. And I fear sometimes that the body of Christ has just accepted that as their identity. That this is who I am. No, that's not who you are. Jesus Christ did not be born. He wasn't born in the town of the cross so you can just agree with what the enemy says about your life. He was born and died, lived all these years, and then died on the cross, resurrected from the grave. So you can align yourself with what he says about you. With what he says about you. But pastor, why do I keep dealing with this stuff? I don't know. All I know is this, is that he's the healer, he's good, and I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. Because on that day, they prophetically signified that he is the healer. You don't have to carry that stress anymore. I'm, I'm a little nervous to say this because because it's gotten real to some people, and I understand that, so I'm trying to be extremely sensitive to this. You have to understand my heart in this. I'm not bowing to any COVID-19. I'm not bowing to any of it. I know it's real. I know it's out there. I know it's there. But so was Goliath. He was real. He was out there. He came and mocked, not just the people of God. He came and mocked God. And I feel like that's what's happening right now. Where's your God, this virus says. Where's your God? Well, get ready, virus. Because the church has got its sling and stones. And we ain't standing for it no more. Amen? I'm not... I'm not talking about, I know, that, I know that it's affected people. You have to know my heart on this. But as the children and the people of God, we can no longer stand in the fields anymore and allow the giants dictate our lives anymore. We have to stand up for what's right. We have to stand up by faith with the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit with us strapped up, ready to go. And now start to be on the offense rather than defense. I'm tired of playing defense. I'm ready to go and play offense now. I'm ready to hear the battle cry and run after this thing. Come on, somebody. And no matter how that manifests itself, the church will come on top of this. I promise you, we're going to lead the way. The church is going to lead the way in this. Amen? So they brought myrrh, <laughs> brought frankincense, signifying him as the healer. Gold is the royalty. And then last point is they brought myrrh. Myrrh is mentioned as a rare perfume with intoxicating qualities. When you think of the word intoxicating, what do you normally think of? Somebody who's drunk, Right? I'm sure just by statistics, and most of us maybe not have come from a church background. You know you've had a couple too many, right? Come on, let's just be real. And you know what it's like, right? You know what it's like to be intoxicated. You see, people are intoxicated with a lot of different things in life to try to bring completion and satisfaction in their heart. And they reach out for all sorts of things. 
no matter what it is. You fill in the blank. Maybe it is drugs. Maybe it is alcohol. But by average, not a lot of people deal with that. I know our county does, <laughs> right? And I know that the church, us, us, River of Life Church, we're going to do something about it. We're going to continue to pray, worship. We're going to lead the way, right? I want to see crime rate go down. I want to see drug use go down. I want to see all these things happen. But it's going to take a church who believes in the Father to make these things happen. But not just believe, but to have some action behind what they're doing. You see, because when you're a drunk person, and you know what I'm talking about if you've ever been in this scene before, you never have to tell a drunk person to go talk to somebody. Right? You never have to tell a drunk person to go talk to somebody. They're just sitting there, and they just think everybody's their friend. Hey, what's going on? Woo! It's party time. Right? I was an Uber driver for Jesus in Illinois. I would take the late, late shift. When the bars were shutting down at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, that was mine. Because they were the most fun. I can't tell you how many people I prayed for, right, talked to. There's this one individual who is completely, she had the phone, she had a pretend phone up to her ear calling a guy named David one time in the back of my van. David, I'm like, you don't even have a phone on, lady. I'm like, are you okay? I thought I had to ask her to get out because I thought, you know, she's going to do what, you know, normal drunk people do. You never have to convince a drunk person of joy. You never have to convince a drunk person, an intoxicated person of of, him, of going out and being bold. Never have to. It happens naturally because the substance that they're intoxicated with allows them to be free, allows them to be loose, allows them to not have any worry about what other people think. Come on, you guys know where I'm going with this, right? You see, because when you're intoxicated with the presence of Jesus, you're going to care less about you. You're going to care more about him and the world around you. And no one's going to have to convince you. Pastor Jake's not going to be able to stand up here and tell you it's important, guys, to tell people about Jesus. Why? Because you're naturally going to want to pray and, and expand the kingdom of God when you're intoxicated with the right thing. And I think sometimes all we need to do is take a big, heavy drink of Jesus. Because what matters the most, guys, is the presence of Jesus going into 2021. What matters the most is what he sings, what he says, and what he's doing. What matters the most is being infiltrated and intoxicated with this presence. So you know what that means? At work, guess what? You're intoxicated with this presence. When you're in, working in your garden, guess what? You're intoxicated with this presence. When you're, when you're jogging, you're intoxicated. When you're at the gym, you're intoxicated. The presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus. That's what matters in our hearts and our lives. That's what should matter in our hearts and our lives. But yet we try to convince ourselves out of sharing Jesus with somebody by saying things like this. What if I offend them? What if I don't know the right answer? What if God doesn't pull through? We convince ourselves we have an argument and a conversation with us to try to get us and talk ourselves out of simply obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit in that moment. How do I know that? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. This is the real deal. And the only solution is to drink. Not, you know what I mean. Drink of him. That's what I mean when we have the form of godliness but deny its power. It's awesome in here. It's real when it's out there. Amen? Amen? Isn't it great when you can feel the presence of Jesus when you're in a, in a corporate setting like this? Maybe this is new to you. I want you to know that if you felt something today, that's Jesus. 
that's just not you thinking to yourselves that it's, it's Jesus, okay? It's the person in the presence of Jesus. But when it gets really real is when you go out and you hear the Holy Spirit say something to you and you put your feet now to some action and you put some words to what he's saying and all of a sudden you see miracles beginning to happen. You wanna know how to get crime right down? You wanna know how to get this stuff down? Let's start being and doing what Jesus asks us to do with the presence of Jesus so intoxicating us that we don't care who we talk to. I know, I'm not asking you all to be evangelists, but I am asking you to go and be Jesus with skin on. That's what I'm asking you to do. To go out there and be a light unto this world and salt unto this earth. It's the only way that we're going to populate heaven. And unfortunately right now, I think, I could be wrong. But I think the enemy's trying to scare us away because he knows that there's a great awakening taking place in the church. There's a great awakening taking place. His time's clicking. His clock is running. And it's almost time's up because we ain't putting up with it anymore. Right? Amen? In your prayer closet, when you're interceding, when you're, when you're expressing your gifts, all the things matter. But when you're at work, it matters. It matters how you talk. It matters how you conduct yourself. It matters if we're leading people to Jesus or not. It matters. You're going to get it wrong? Absolutely. But you're going to try. I'm going to try. You're going to try? I'm going to try. See, and with some of us here, as I get ready to close, if you've got some light music back there, thank you. Some of us here are hearing this. Some of us are going, oh, pastor, you crazy. you so crazy. That's not going to work. I can never do that. That'll never happen. Okay, then it'll never happen with you then. I'm, we're, listen, the church has to be done to try to convince you of this kind of stuff. We need to start seeing some action, baby. Because the time's short, listen to me, the time's short, Jesus is coming back. And we need to populate heaven with, with souls. We need to make this happen, Captain. It's got to work. There is no plan B. This is it. So you can sit on the sidelines. It's totally fine. It's okay. I told you I'm really bad at Christmas messages. We can sit on the sidelines and that's okay. You can do that. We can do that. That's fine. You're still going to go to heaven. Everything's fine. You'll be okay. Oh, I want to be on the field, man. I want to be on the field playing. And let me tell you, to you fourth quarter saints, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> the ones who said, I've done my work already. Let's let the others do it. You still have a plan and a purpose. Let me tell you, I think God's doing something with the boomer generation. I think God's raising back up the boomer generation. Come on, somebody. You matter. I'm so excited about what's about ready to happen. To see the goodness of God move in a powerful way. But the realities are this. Is that... We have to come clean before the Lord. We have to be known by him. Amen? We've got to be known by him. He's got to know the secrets of our heart that no one else knows about. Yeah, I can sit here and tell you God knows everything, and we can have a conversation and debate about that. Obviously, God knows everything about you. He knows the numbers on your head. He gets it. He knows you. But there's something special when you come to him and you say, God, I'm dealing with this. I haven't forgiven X, Y, Z. I haven't, and I need to. It's holding me back. Listen to me, don't go into 2021 with the same baggage that kept you in 2020. We can't afford it. Don't do it, don't do it. You will find yourself spinning your wheels like crazy if you do that. Don't do it. Now's the time, now's the time. 
So these three gifts signify the royalty, the healing, and the complete satisfaction that only Jesus can bring. And on that day, they prophesied by prophetically giving him a gift to say, this is who you are. And thank God that those wise men, those magi didn't listen to the king. Because if they did, hear me, there's a message in there that I'm going to try to let you figure out. When they listened to the king, if they would have, I'm afraid that that day Jesus would have never made it. He is royalty, amen. He is the healer. And he's the only one who can satisfy. Here's what I want to do for the next minute. If we can, let's all stand.